co-chair of J Street U at Bard, one of the many chapters of the student arm of J Street, the largest pro-Israel, pro-peace group in the country. It is a lobbying organization, a grassroots initiative, and a rapidly expanding and much needed movement. J Street grew in Washington out of the demand for a more urgent push for a real two-state solution and a more balanced discussion of the needs of both Palestinians and Israelis. In one moment, I will turn the podium over to Roger Bergwitz, esteemed associate professor of political studies and human rights at the acad and academic director of the Hannah Arden Center for Politics and Humanities here at Bard College. Roger will introduce Peter Reinhardt with more academic depth as to his renowned position in the fields of political science and journalism. From a near personal standpoint, I remember reading Peter Reinhardt's article, The Failure of the American Jewish Establishment, for the first time in June 2010, around the time of the Flotilla incident, and as I was preparing to go to West Bank that summer with the Bard Palestinian Youth Initiative. Whereas I could not relate to many of the voices in the Washington Jewish community at this time, when I read this piece, I felt like someone spoke for me and understood why I rejected certain actions of Israel without rejecting the state of Israel in its entirety. I am honored to have Peter Bynum here tonight, and now I turn the podium over to Roger Berkowitz of the Hannah Arendt Center, who will co-sponsor this evening. Thank you to Sarah. Uh, it's it's really wonderful to to see um, students getting this involved in, in, in organizing lectures like this. And Sarah has done, with other help, I'm sure, an incredible job. So I just want to thank her for this. Um, I, I've been brought in just uh, to help out a little at the end, and, and uh, it's my pleasure to do so. But she deserves the credit. For um, it is a distinct uh, pleasure to, uh, to introduce our, our speaker tonight, uh, Peter Beinart. Um, there, are, there are a few people uh, who can um, put their minds to writing about, thinking about an issue uh, in America today and, and suddenly become one of the leading voices on that issue, um, whatever it is. And Peter has, has, has shown that ability over and over again. Um, his, his, he's written a number of books. Uh, his uh, book before this, if I'm not mistaken, was The Icarus Syndrome, A History of American Hubris, which really did in many ways help crystallize uh, a debate about um, American foreign policy uh, in, the, in the mid, uh, mid part of the last uh, decade, the first decade of the 21st century. Uh, he's been uh, a writer for the New Republic, he writes frequently for many other journals. Uh, He's been a senior fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations at a very young age, uh, associate professor of journalism at CUNY, the University of New York. He currently uh, runs a blog uh, for the Daily Beast, a very influential and important blog, Open Zion. Um, like Sarah, I uh, read his essay uh, in the New York New Books in 2010, The Failure of the American Jewish Establishment. And, uh, it did speak to me personally as well. Uh, I think he speaks for a lot of people of your and our generation. Um, I, and I won't say much more about it right now. Uh, you know, for me, this is a, a real pleasure. Um, some of you may know that Hannah Arendt uh, wrote very much about anti-Semitism and about Jewish questions. She was one of the early and strong proponents at the time with Judas and Agnes of a binational state, something that I think we all, Peter at least, realizes this is probably impractical at this point, he says so in his book. And yet, uh, many of the critiques that she makes and arguments she made 60 years ago, um, I think, uh, are, are very much the root of, of a lot of his thinking uh, about Israel and, 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 and the Middle East. So it's a great pleasure for me as the head of the Conference Center to welcome you here today. So please welcome Peter Beiner. Personal attacks 
ad hominem denunciations. Um, and I said, outside of my own family? Uh, yeah, there have been a few. Um, uh, my, um, my wife sent out an email, the kind that you know, my spouse is doing when someone has written a book. And she said, uh, you know, you can agree or disagree with Peter's book, but we're very proud that he wrote a book. And um, she got back one email which said, um, I would never buy that book. Uh, Peter's a fraud. Uh, he's a threat to the Jewish people. And she sent on the email and she said, I don't really know who was that person who was so hostile to you. Uh, and I said, don't you remember? That's my cousin David. Uh, um, uh, uh, my mother said it's a good thing that my grandmother doesn't know how to vlog. Um, even in my own family, I find, actually, um, that although I write often about the younger generation of American Jews, I, I, I suspect that I may be losing the younger generation in my own family, since my son, who's six, goes to Jewish school, has an Israeli flag on his wall, often shows distinct signs of a kind of a right-leaning religious Zionist perspective that would probably, probably put him closer to places like Commentary and the Wall Street Journal than to my own set of politics. Uh, so, for instance, um, we uh, were going to Israel in, in June, and so uh, I said, Ezra, where, where do you want to go uh, when we're in Israel? He said, oh, I want to go to Mount Sinai. And so there was a kind of like, uncomfortable pause. And I said, well, you know, actually, actually not Sinai. That's really not in Israel anymore. Israel gave that to Egypt uh, in a peace agreement. It was a kind of a, gave me this look of horror. And he said, they gave it to Pharaoh? So, um, yeah, there, there's, a, uh, there's an interesting debate that happens even in my own family and position. Um, uh, as it happens, um, uh, I'm speaking to you on Yom Hatzmut, on Israel and Independence Day. Um, uh, part of um, a cycle in Israel. Uh, the day before Yom Hatzmut is Yom Hatzikaron. Um, uh, as night falls in Israel on Yom Hatzikaron, the day that Israel remembers its fallen in wars, a one-minute siren goes off. Everybody stops. Even people driving in cars get out of their cars. Stop by the side of the car. Um, the next morning, a siren goes on at 11 a.m. for two minutes, in which, again, people stop their daily routine. Um, the, the flag of the State of Israel is loaded to half mass for the entire day. And then, in a kind of a recapitulation of our historic cycle of death or near death and rebirth, uh, when evening strikes and it becomes, moves from the Yom HaZikaron to Yom HaZikaron, Israel Independence Day, the flag is raised to half, to, to full staff. Um, and I think it's fitting um, on such a day um, for those of us, even those of us who are critical of Israeli policy, as I am, um, to reflect on what an extraordinary blessing it is for those of us who are Jewish to live, um, to be amongst that small group of Jews over the last 2,000 years who have the good fortune to live in the, with a Jewish state. Um, firstly, because we now have a state whose mission statement is the protection of Jewish life around the world, to make sure that if anyone tries again just wholesale slaughter Jews, there will be at least one state in the world whose mission statement is to prevent that from happening. So that may seem remote to some of you, um, but I'm old enough to remember when a Jewish tank sent planes to Ethiopia to pick up some of the poorest and most destitute people in the world, the Ethiopian Jews, and bring them back to reconnect with the people they had been disconnected from since the days when the temple stood. The second thing, that we owe to the State of Israel is the recreation of Hebrew as a living language. Without the Zionist movement and the state that it helped, that it created, Hebrew would remain a dead language, and all of the problems that diaspora Jews have in maintaining a Jewish identity, which are considerable, would be profoundly more difficult if there were no Hebrew language for, for to remain, to be a cultural and linguistic center for us. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, for me, what makes the State of Israel remarkable is that in 1948, three years after the Holocaust, while the stench of Jewish death still hung over Europe, 
while Israel is in war for its survival with all of its Arab neighbors, when it fielded a nascent, ragtag military composed of significant men significant number of people who had numbers tattooed on their arms because they had come straight from concentration camps. Israel Sounders wrote a declaration of independence that promised complete equality of social and political rights to all its inhabitants, irrespective of race, religion, and sex. And despite the enormous trauma and suffering that Israel's war of independence brought for Israel's Palestinian population, despite the enormous toll that the War of Independence took on the 750,000 Palestinians who, uh, who were expelled or fled their homes, Israel gave the right of citizenship to those Palestinian citizens of Israel who remained within its borders, even though Palestinian refugees were not given the right of citizenship in Lebanon and Syria. And although there is a tension, an undeniable tension between Zionism and liberal democracy, between a state that, with a special mission to safeguard and represent the Jewish people, and a state whose Declaration of Independence promises complete equality of social and political rights to all its citizens, irrespective of race, religion, and sex, I believe there is a basis in Israel's founding document in his Declaration of Independence for a greater reconciliation between those two principles. Two principles that I believe are both valid. I believe that it is valid to believe in a Jewish state with a special mission for Jewish protection uh, and representation. There are many countries around the world that have religious symbols on their flag. There are many crosses on flags around the world. Israel is not unique in having religious symbolism on its flag. It's simply unique in that it has a Jewish religious symbol on its flag. Israel is not unique in that it has a preferential, preferential immigration policy for Jews. Many democracies, particularly in Eastern Europe, have preferential immigration policies for their populations. Israel is only unique in that it has a preferential immigration policy for Jews. There is, I believe, within Israel's original boundaries, the original 1967 line, the foundation for a deeper reconciliation, although there will always be some tension between Zionism and liberal democracy. Uh, the, 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 the fundamental, uh, and in fact there has been such progress even within Israel's history. From 1949 until 1966, Israel's Palestinian citizens, although they had citizenship, lived under martial law. In 1966, as a result of struggle, political struggle, martial law was lifted. And yet, one of the great tragedies of Israeli history is that six months after martial law was lifted for Palestinian citizens of Israel, Israel conquered the West Bank and Gaza Strip and took control over millions of Palestinians to whom it gave no citizenship at all. A population that has no right to vote, that lives under a combination of military, Ottoman, and Jordanian law, while Jewish settlers in the West Bank live under civil law, a population that is dramatically restricted in its movement, even though the Jews along whom, alongside whom they live have relative freedom of movement. And if this occupation, if Israel continues to entrench itself in the West Bank to such a degree that it becomes impossible to create a contiguous viable Palestinian state near the 1967 lines, then it will be impossible to continue to call Israel, a democracy in good conscience, and Israel will become something closer to an apartheid state. And I don't use the word apartheid state lightly, but I use, it, I use that phrase because in doing so I'm not quoting Jimmy Carter, I'm quoting those two well-known anti-Semites, Ehud Barak and Ehud Omer, both of whom have warned that this is the future that Israel faces if it cannot extricate itself from the West Bank and allow the creation of a contiguous viable Palestinian state there that gives the Palestinian population of the West Bank and Gaza citizenship, the right to vote, and the right to live under civil law in a state of their own. I am not suggesting in this narrative that I believe the Palestinians are blameless for the failure to create the Palestinian state. I think there have been significant failures of Palestinian political leadership. I think the resort 
to violence against civilians, which I call, call in my book grotesque and unforgivable, I think has marred the Palestinian national movement. I believe there has been a troubling tendency amongst Palestinian leaders to minimize the historic Jewish presence and connection to the land of Israel. And I believe there are real questions about whether the Palestinian leadership will be willing to make the compromises on a large-scale right of Palestinian refugee return to Israel's original to, is, to Israel's original boundaries that would be necessary to make a two-state solution work. I think it is fair to say that there is in the Palestinian population and in the Arab world more generally a great struggle over Israel's right to exist. It is not a struggle in which either side in that struggle in the Arab world consists of people who are thrilled about Israel's existence. I think there are very few people in the Middle East who go to bed at night and say, thank goodness a Jewish state was created in our midst. But in the real world, the struggle is between people who will reluctantly come to terms with Israel's right to exist on 78% of British mandatory Palestine, if Palestinians have the rights and dignity that come with statehood on the West Bank and Gaza, 22% of British mandatory Palestine. And the real struggle pits those people against those in the Middle East who want to struggle to the death to try to extinguish the Jewish state, whether it takes 100 years or longer, and no matter how many people die. And it seems to me it is absolutely incumbent upon us who care about the future and the security of the state of Israel, along with the rights and dignity of the Palestinian people, for Israel to act in a way that strengthens the hands of those people who will be living to, willing to live at peace with it. Uh, and when Israel continues to build more and more settlements in the West Bank, not just build them, but subsidize Israelis to move across the Green Line into the West Bank, makes it cheaper for them to live there. Just this very week, Benjamin Netanyahu's government decided to legalize three outposts in the West Bank that had been illegal even under Israeli law. And what Israel does is it makes those Palestinians, like Mahmoud Abbas and Salam Fayyad, willing to live at peace with Israel in a two-state solution. It makes them look like fools for thinking that they can achieve a two-state solution non-violently. And it makes the work of groups like Hamas and Hezbollah that want a military conflict and have not come to terms with Israel's right to exist, it makes their lives so much easier. And I believe that Israel has as a country that doesn't have a huge margin for error in terms of security, has an absolute obligation to be smart. Uh, and we, as Israel supporters, have an obligation to try to help Israel be smart. So the question arises, given the fact that American Jews, in our domestic politics, are a population strikingly defined by our liberal democratic values, American Jews vote for Barack Obama at 78%. That's at a higher rate than did women, than did Hispanics, than did gays and lesbians. It's almost twice the rate of white Protestants and Catholics. How can it be that a community that has been so connected in American history to the civil rights movement, to the women's rights movement, to the gay and lesbian rights movement, to the labor movement, can, can create an organizational infrastructure that seems so often unconcerned about the struggle for democracy and human rights in a Jewish state. How is it that we have created a, an organizational establishment that continually defines being pro-Israel as, support, as, as supporting the policies of the Israeli government, even if those policies run directly counter to the principles of Israel's Declaration of Independence? And I think the fundamental problem is that American Jews at least as an organized community, have not found a way to talk about Jewish power. We still describe ourselves in, again and again, in myriad ways, as a reviled and powerless population struggling merely to survive. If you know, any of you know the, the joke about Jewish holidays, the old Jewish holidays essentially consisted of the narrative of they tried to kill us, we survived, let's eat. Um, uh, so, if you ask young American Jews about the holiday of Purim, they're likely to say, oh sure, I know the holiday of Purim, I was told about that, sure. Uh, Haman tried to kill us, but Queen Esther and, and her uncle Mordecai saved us, and then that's, that's pretty much the end, and then we get to eat a hamantashim, which is very tasty. 
Um, but that's not how the Book of Esther ends. Uh, the Book of Esther ends not with Jewish survival, but with Jewish power. It ends with King Ahasuerus giving Jews the right to retaliate against Haman's people and Jews killing 75,000 people. It ends not with survival, it moves beyond survival to a discussion of the ethics, a troubling discussion, a discussion about which our tradition has an enormous amount to say about the ethics of power. Ask American Jews about Hanukkah. They'll say, sure, oh, I know the story of Hanukkah, sure. The Syrian Greeks wouldn't let us practice Judaism. They desecrated the temple, but the Maccabees rose up. They expelled the Syrian Greeks, and they rededicated the temple, and there was a miracle. The oil lasted for eight days, and then we eat a lot because they're very, very tasty. Um, but why do we end the story of Hanukkah there? The story of Hanukkah was the beginning of the Hasmonean dynasty, the last experience of Jewish state before our own time. It was a very troubling, difficult experience of Jewish power, the use and often abuse of Jewish power. Our tradition has an enormous amount to say about that. We never talk about that. And I think that is at the core of the reason that American Jewish organizations have so much trouble speaking to young American Jews. It's partly, I should, I should say, because, young, because the American Jewish community has not done a very good job of teaching young American Jewish kids about Judaism, so that it's harder if you grow up without much knowledge of joy in and fascination with Judaism to feel much of a connection to the Jewish state. But the other reason, I believe, for this profound disconnect is that the reality that many, many young American Jews experience is a reality of privilege and power. Young American Jews are a privileged community in the United States. Israel, although it still faces very real threats, is a regional superpower in the Middle East. And yet, and so it is precisely what our Jewish tradition has to tell us about the question of Jewish power, about how we have used it, about how we can struggle to use it ethically, that I think has the greatest potential meaning for this generation of American Jews. And yet, this generation of American Jews is again and again confronted with a narrative in which they are essentially told that the Jewish condition has not fundamentally changed since the 1930s and 40s. A story that is not, that is not true to the reality of their lives. Sometimes I find that young American Jews wonder why they should care about what happens in Israel at all. And most American Jews of any age had never been to Israel. American Jews are a very fairly assimilated population. Often Israel can seem to be a very distant place. But I think the reason that all American Jews, especially young American Jews, have a stake in what happens in the state of Israel is because Israel is the great test of Jewish power. Israel, if what most young American Jews in my experience feel is precious about Judaism, is the Jewish ethical tradition. The idea that during our long night of oppression and powerlessness, we spun visions of human dignity and justice that inspired people across the world. And that that's why American Jews have been so much at the forefront of so many struggles for human dignity and for social justice. And yet, if it turns out that that tradition of struggle for justice and dignity can only have meaning when Jews are powerless, and once Jews have a state, it turns out that that tradition cannot inform the actions of the state, then in retrospect, what good was that tradition after all? What good was the Jewish ethical tradition if it could only have meaning during powerlessness and could not survive the confrontation with power? If that turns out to be the reality, as Israel collapses as a democratic project, as Zionism collapses as a democratic project, it will have reverberations for the experience that young American Jews have of Judaism every bit as profound as the experience that their parents and grandparents had when they were lucky enough to witness the birth of a Jewish state. There's a quote that I love by Rabbi Shlomo Karlbach when he said, the Torah is a commentary on the world, but the world is also a commentary on the Torah. And if it turns out that in the world, the lived world of Jewish reality, that the Jewish tradition, the values of Torah, cannot influence the behavior of a Jewish state, that will have profound implications for how we see Torah, how we see Judaism itself, no matter how far away we live from the state of Israel. 
So I think what we need to say to young American Jews is that there is a reality in Israel that is very troubling. And that if you want to have a real relationship with the state of Israel, a real encounter with all of the people who live in the state of Israel, under the state of Israel's domain, which includes the West Bank, even according to the United States government, includes Gaza, because the United States government defines Gaza as still occupied by the state of Israel, then you need to encounter all of Israel. And that it is not acceptable to send kids on birthright trips to Israel. As much as I think it's wonderful for kids to get to go see the Kotel and the beaches of Tel Aviv, as I did when I was young, that it's not ethically acceptable to send them to Israel and never have them interact with Palestinians. Um, that it's not, that it is intellectually insulting to tell young American Jews who've been raised to believe that what makes part of what makes Judaism precious is a tradition of critical inquiry and open debate, that they should start with the assumption that everything the government of Israel does is right and work backwards to reason why. And so I think on this Yom HaAzlud, what the American Jewish Organizational Establishment should really be telling young American Jews is that this democratic state of Israel, this flawed but genuine experiment in democracy in a region that doesn't have a lot of experience with democracy is your birthright. It's your patrimony. It was won by past generations at a cost that you will never even be able to fully comprehend. And that if you, if you do not pass it on as a democratic experiment, your children and grandchildren, it will be a stain upon your lives. And you will be judged very harshly by Jewish history. We need to be told that this was not created, the state, to be another Hasmonean dynasty. It was created to be a state that would learn the lessons that Europe betrayed. Most of Zionism's founders were people who originally wanted to live in the countries of their birth in Europe and desperately hoped that Europe would live up to the Enlightenment liberal ideals that they believed in fervently and reluctantly came to the conclusion that they could not live safeful lives in the continent of Europe, and came to the Zionist movement with a belief that the Jewish state could be more true to Enlightenment principles, to liberal democratic principles, than the European countries that they came from. And that it is that vision of a liberal democratic Jewish state that young American Jews, given our own precious heritage of democratic struggle, need to be involved in. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel once said, Dark and dreadful would be our lives today without the comfort and joy that radiates from the land of Israel. But then he said, Israel's existence alone is not enough. The question Heschel said is, how do we make this estate worth waiting 2,000 years for? I think that's the question we should ask young American Jews. How are you going to make this estate worth waiting 2,000 years for? And hope that in their answer, that Heschel Zion, a liberal democratic Zionism, the Zionism, of Israel's Declaration of Independence can be reborn for all of the people under Israeli control, Jewish and Palestinian together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, so we have a good amount of time, about 55 minutes for questions. Uh, in many ways addressed to younger American Jews and others. So anyone uh, is able to ask questions specifically on students, others. Actually, 
a trip to the State of Israel could even be a, a, a vehicle for a deeper connection to Judaism itself. Because one of the experiences that diaspora Jews tend to have when they go to Israel, amongst many, but one of the most powerful, is an extraordinary sense of wonder at seeing a Jewish society. If you've always grown up as a small minority, it's a remarkable thing to look around you and see the vast multitude of Jewish diversity from every corner of the earth screaming at one another, yelling at one another, you know, trying to fight to get in line in front of one another, uh, essentially come together on the land that we have such a deep connection to. So, I'm, I'm all for that. I'm sympathetic. I'm, I, you know, um, uh, there's a reason that we send our own children to Jewish school. I feel very committed to raising children with a strong sense of Jewish identity. But, not at the cost of pretending that Palestinians don't exist, or only hearing about Palestinians through other voices rather than letting them speak for themselves. Partly because I actually think that it is not only ethically indefensible, but I think it even serves, the, it, it fails to actually accomplish the goals that the program's founders want, which is a deep connection to the State of Israel. Because I really believe a deep and enduring connection to the State of Israel has to be based on reality. It can't be based on some disnified vision of Israel that essentially skirts around all the difficult issues. In the same way that you can't have a really loving, I believe, and true relationship with the United States if you try to ignore all of the dark and painful and difficult things that exist within our borders. So, what I find when young American Jews go to the West Bank and interact with Palestinians and see the reality of Palestinian life under occupation, hear the stories of people whose families were scattered by the War of Independence, which Palestinians call the Nakba. See the experience of people who have to wait uh, in humiliating conditions at checkpoints to get to go visit a family member. See the experience of people who are denied often the ability to go to visit East Jerusalem. What they find, what they come back with, are a lot of difficult questions and a deep sense of internal turmoil and struggle. To me, that's not a bad thing. To me, that's the glory of the Jewish tradition. Our tradition is supposed to be Israel, struggle. It is supposed to be about struggle. It is not supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be, in fact, about the struggle to live ethically as a people, to safeguard ourselves, but also to remember, as we say, around this time of the year, around the holiday of Passover, that we know the heart of the stranger because we were strangers in the land of Egypt. It's no coincidence that on Rosh Hashanah, when Jews, in, the, in the Torah portion of Jews on Rosh Hashanah, we read about Hagar, an Egyptian woman, Hagar, the stranger, an Egyptian woman calling out to God. On, on the second most holy day in Judaism, we read the story of an Egyptian woman, a non-Jew, calling out to God, and God hearing her cry, and her giving her the son Ishmael. That, it seems to me, is very, very important to what the Jewish tradition is, and I think we honor that when we send, send young American Jewish kids to have experiences with Palestinians in the West Bank. And if possible, it would be wonderful for them to have experiences with Palestinians in Gaza too. Peter, would you take us into the future? <laughs> um, and really, I mean, paint a picture of Israel at its 200th anniversary. If there isn't a separate Palestine, you know, if there isn't a two-state solution, as you see it, I had a, um, funny, um, sometimes I find in private conversations with American Jewish organizational leaders, you find people who publicly may spend a lot of their time um, trying to ward off criticisms of Israel, but in private you can find sometimes a stunning uniqueness. Uh, a prominent figure in American, in American Jewish organization in a meeting with me a few months ago said, you know what, Peter? You are. I am much luckier than you. And I said, Why are you luckier than you? He's an older man. He said, Oh, because in 20 years I won't be around to see what's happened to the state of Israel. I'll be dead. Um, uh, which I thought was quite a remarkable statement um, from someone who's an uh, influential person in a major mainstream American Jewish organization. Um, Israel, if Israel makes permanent its occupation, 
There are people who already believe that it is too late to create a two-state solution to create a continuous viable Palestinian state. I'm not one of them, um, but nor do I believe that we have decades and decades. Um, then we will invite the Palestinians. Uh, we will get on a silver platter. We will invite the Palestinians to struggle for the nature of that state, um, because the Palestinians will not live, nor should they live, permanently under occupation. I desperately, uh, um, uh, I desperately hope that the way Palestinians conduct that struggle, in contrast to the way they have it sometimes in the past, <coughs> will be through nonviolence. Uh, uh, but even if it is through nonviolence. It will be a struggle that culminates in the end of Israel as a Jewish state, or it will be a struggle that culminates in the end of Israel as a democratic state. Uh, uh, the, two, the, the tension that I believe exists within uh, Zionism and liberalism will become, will burst, will become impossible in a condition in which Israel is in permanent occupation of the West Bank. Um, uh, and uh, I think um, in such a struggle, perhaps, very awful things will happen. Um, and I think ultimately, in the long term, it will turn Israel more and more into a pariah state, um, which I believe is really the opposite of what Israel was meant to be. I mean, if you read Herzl's novel, Ankh Malam, about Herzl's vision of an imaginary Jewish state, um, it's easy to make fun of the novel, because the truth is, Herzl had very little understanding of, um, of anything that was on the ground in the Middle East. And in many ways, Herzl had very little understanding of Judaism. I mean, Herzl's the guy who, the first time he went to a synagogue in, in, uh, in Italy, he on Shabbat, he tried to tip the usher. Um, uh, so this is a man who didn't know a lot about a lot of things. But still, even in its perhaps deeply simplified and flawed way, Herzl's vision of the Jewish state was of a state that would be true to liberal enlightenment principles and would spread them around the world. I mean, it's striking if you read on the the way in which Herschel imagines that Israel will help to cure diseases and then that people from Africa will interact with people in, in the Jewish state and will, they will be able to help them work on struggling again. It was a very, very outward-looking vision uh, about what this Jewish state could do for the world. And this will be the total inversion of that. And it will produce a situation which I think many Israelis will ultimately leave. Um, now, of course, one needs to acknowledge that even if Israel and the Palestinians do come to a solution that allows Palestinians the right and dignity of statehood, Israel will also still face profound challenges with its own Arab or Palestinian citizen population. Uh, a population, although it has the right to citizenship, does suffer structural discrimination as acknowledged even by the Israeli government itself in the Orr Commission that it did into investigating the conditions of Israel's Palestinian Arab citizenry. But I think then the challenge will be for Israel to make a dramatic effort at alleviating the many, many ways in which Arab citizens are, are left to feel as second-class citizens um, in order to try to deepen their connection with the state of Israel. Um, it will always, there will always be a difficulty that Israel's Palestinian Arab citizens will have with a state that has a Jewish law on it, and with a national anthem that speaks of the Jewish soul and with the right of return. Um, but the state of England has an Anglican church, uh, has a royal family that is led by the Anglican church. There are many, there are many countries that have religious symbols on their flag. If, I believe, Israel follows in path of Yitzhak Rabin in the 1990s, when Rabin built dozens of health clinics in Israeli Arab villages and towns. He equalized childhood allowances for Jews and Arabs. He instituted affirmative action for Israel's civil service for its Palestinian Arab population. And we, we alleviate this historical problem, which is that Israeli governments have not allowed Arab parties into the government, governing coalition that I think then you can move towards a deeper reconciliation between Zionism and liberal democracy within Israel's boundaries. But it will never be possible if Israel controls the West Bank, because the West Bank breeds so much hatred, the occupation breeds so much hatred between, even between Jews and Palestinian Arab citizens inside the Green Line. Hi, um, you spoke a little bit about uh, the ethics of power and stuff, and one of the issues both in Israel and Palestine and in the greater Middle East as a whole 
is the allocation of fresh water. And there are a lot of claims that Israel has been unfairly uh, taking Palestinian fresh water for their own use. So how do you raise a new generation of Israeli leaders who see that um, the path uh, to success and the path to peace and prosperity for Israel comes through, you know, cooperation with the Palestinians on things like fresh water and other, really everything, because a successful Israel is ultimately going to mean uh, a Palestine that's at peace. I think you make a good point, and I, the question of water allocation often doesn't get enough discussion um, in the question, for instance, of a two-state solution. I mean, what Palestinians want and have the right to want is not only a state that has territorial viability and contiguity um, in the West Bank, but also has some control over its own water supply, rather than simply having to buy its water from Israel. I think that's a very legitimate concern. And there are, you can find that some, some of Israel has allocated, has built settlements precisely in proximity to water supply sources. Um, and this is, I think, a legitimate Palestinian concern in thinking about the viability, the economic viability, um, uh, of, of a Palestinian state. One of the problems you have um, between Israelis and Palestinians today is that there is very little interaction, except at the point of a gun. I mean, the, mo the dominant form of interaction between Israeli Jews and Palestinians in the West Bank is when Israeli Jews do their military service. Um, there was a time when large numbers of Palestinians used to come from God before the before, um, really, before the 1990s and before the Second Intifada, when large numbers of Palestinians used to come from the West Bank and Gaza into Israel to work. Those were not equal interactions, but they were still human interactions of a kind that you can't have when your interaction is simply with, with, with a military force. Uh, when one person is looking at someone who's holding a gun and is terrified, and the person holding the gun is also themselves terrified. Um, and this is, I think, um, one of the really frightening things that's happening in the conflict today, that we are raising generations on both sides that have essentially no humanizing experience of the other. And it's interesting, um, if you look at polling amongst Israeli Jews, I think one worrying thing is that it's actually the oldest cohort of Israeli Jews that tends to have the most liberal democratic perspective when it comes to Palestinians. And I think that's partly simply because they're more likely to have had more interactions with them. Similarly, this is especially true in Gaza, you're, gen you're raising a whole generation of people that have never had any interaction with Israel. And one of the really fascinating things that, that happened, uh, and that people have told me even about Hamas, is that the Hamas leaders, who are a little bit more open and and, and willing to contemplate the idea of, a two, of, living, of living with Israel in a two-state solution, Hamas has not had gone nearly as far as it needs to go, are those who have actually spent time in Israeli prisons. Um, because although spending this time in Israeli prisons is a very brutal experience, at least leads you to some interaction with Israelis. Some learning of Hebrew. You see people like, although it's not Hamas, Marwan Barghouti, who learned Hebrew and had some experience of Israel, even if it's in a place like prison, that actually can lead to some basis of understanding and cooperation. I mean, there's this amazing interview this week in the Jewish newspaper, The Forward, um, with a Hamas leader uh, 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 named Marzouk, Abu Marzouk. And um, what's, uh, the, this interview in many ways is quite disappointing for those of us who believe that Hamas is going to have to accept Israel's right to exist in the 67 border. But in some ways, what's the most bizarre part of the interview is when the forward interview discuss, starts talking to Marzouk about the protocols of the elders of Zion. Um, and he says, why is Hamas uh, uh, trumpeting this well-known anti-Semitic forgery? And Marzouk says, it's a forgery, I never heard that. Um, now, maybe he's simply lying. Um, but I don't know what's worse, if he's lying or if this is a man so disconnected from reality certainly from Jewish reality, that he's actually unaware that one of the most, that perhaps the most famous anti-Semitic hoax of modern times is an anti-Semitic hoax. And it seems to me it just underscores how dangerous it is to have such radically disconnected populations. Uh, 
Um, so the refugees after the 1948 war have up until now been denied the right of return because they're not Jewish and allowing them back into the state of Israel would upset the demographic balance um, which keeps Jews as a majority in Israel. Um, how do you justify not allowing refugees to return to their former homeland based on the fact that they are not Jewish? Okay. Um, unfortunately, I think it's important to remember that many of the people who we classify as refugees were not born within Israel's present 1967 borders. They are the children and grandchildren of those people. I don't believe, um, I am an anti-utopian liberal, which means, which is to say that I believe that our visions of justice must be measured against the reality that would exist on the ground, rather than some perfect vision that we might have. Um, uh, and in reality, um, the towns and villages and homes that from which people fled in 1948 are not there in large measure anymore. People may, and, I, 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 and, and many Palestinians in my experience say this themselves, that, pe that the keys that people may still be holding are not keys that unlock anything anymore. So the question is, what in reality is going to, is going to be there for those people who, 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 who return, if they return in huge, huge numbers to the state of Israel? I think there, I, I would support some modest re refugee return of people who were actually born in what is now Israel's 1967 lines. And in fact, Israeli leaders have consented. I think uh, Omer was open to some small scale right of return, uh, some small scale return. Interestingly, Omer accepted that there would be some, but he wanted it to be small, probably in the tens of thousands. Mahmoud Abbas, according to what we know from the negotiations, accepted that it should not be so large that it would threaten Israel's demographic character. I believe that the better answer for those people is to return in larger number, for the bulk of them, to return to a Palestinian state where they can see a national anthem and a flag and have the rights and dignity that come with statehood. Um, and there may be others who are taken in by other countries around the world. But I believe in the legitimacy of a Jewish state just as I believe in the legitimacy of a Palestinian state, I believe that a Palestinian state has an obligation to allow Jews to live in it, but I don't have any illusions that a Palestinian state will have a Palestinian right of return and be based on and have Palestinian symbols, just as I believe that Jewish self-determination suggests that we should be able to have a Jewish state with a Jewish right of return and Jewish symbols. And I believe that would be, in the real world, the best outcome for both communities. And I would start with the Palestinians in, in refugee camps in Lebanon, who I believe are the Palestinian refugee population that is all the probably the one that today is suffering the most. At the beginning of your talk, you referred to two former um, Israeli prime ministers, uh, Ehud Barak and Ehud Obama, as anti Semites. Yeah. That was a joke. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm curious as to um, how you think we should go about educating um, American Jewish kids in what Israel is like today if they don't necessarily have the opportunity to go to Israel. Um, that's a that's a good question. Um, I think the first step um, is to try to give young American Jewish kids some <coughs> joy in knowledge of and fascination with Judaism itself. Um, since I think it is hard to appreciate the meaning of a Jewish state, what it means to have a state that ri whose rhythms are the Jewish calendar, who's, uh, um, without having, uh, and it's hard to understand why some people feel so deeply attached, some Jews feel so deeply attached to the state of Israel. Whether ultimately you want Israel to have sovereignty over the West Bank or not, and I don't want Israel to have sovereignty over the West Bank or not, but I don't think you can effectively engage with the debate at all unless you understand 
that the, that, that the book of Genesis uh, has, it is essentially in significant measure about the Jewish interaction with the, with the parts of the world that we now call the West Bank, the places like Hebron and Bethlehem and, and what Jews call Shechem, which is outside of Nablus. You can't even understand the terms of debate uh, in Israel um, unless, you under, unless you have some understanding of the depth to which, uh, the depth of connection biblically between Jews and the West Bank. And I think Palestinian leaders do themselves a disservice um, uh, when they don't acknowledge that. It's, uh, uh, it's not to say for a minute that they should accept Jews living uh, um, uh, as citizens in the West Bank when Palestinians lack citizenship. But I think it's important for Palestinians to say, we recognize these places are sacred to Jews, and we have no problem with Jews living as equal citizens in these places alongside us in a Palestinian state. As long as they live as equal citizens, we open our arms to them um, to do so. Um, so I think that's the beginning. And then I think um, you build upon that, it seems to me, um, upon that foundation of Jewish connection and Jewish commitment. Then, and that I think is the foundational layer, especially with younger children. And then I think the next layer, as they get older and more able to assimilate critical experiences, even if they can't go to Israel, um, is for them to interact with Palestinians. I think every American synagogue should have Palestinian speakers. Every American Jewish newspaper should have Palestinian columnists. Every American Jewish community center should invite Palestinians to speak. The problem is that there is a, right now, essentially many of those organizations will not allow non-Zionists to speak. There are not a lot of Palestinian Zionists out there. Um, uh, um, that is a recipe for essentially no interaction with Palestinians. First of all, even if you don't want a political debate, even if you're not a political institution, you can simply invite Palestinians to talk about their family's history and what happened to their families in 1948, and the drama of their families. The Jews are very interested in these kinds of stories. We know a lot, we have a lot of personal experience with these stories of dispossession, of being scattered across the earth, of families disconnected from one another, and, and we should hear those Palestinian stories, even if we don't always agree with the political implications, just as an exercise in humanity and in individual dignity. Just like we would like Palestinians to go to the Holocaust Memorial Museum and, ha and have an experience of understanding what Jews experience, we should also be willing to have those experiences. And I find in my own interactions and conversations with Palestinians, Open Zion is a very unusual publication in that we have a particular interest in Jewish identity and culture and yet we have Palestinian columnists. Uh, we, we have one Palestinian, one Lebanese columnist, the very eminent Palestinian historian Rashid Khalid, who just wrote two pieces for us last week. And what I find is that although the political conversation can be very hard, because Palestinians can come from a very fundamentally different perspective about the entire legitimacy of the Jewish state, that even with that political difference, which can be very, very difficult and can be fraught, there can be a basis for a human connection, for a common recognition of human dignity and affirmation of human dignity that is very, very important. Um, and I believe that if people can't have that experience in Israel or in the West Bank or in Gaza, then we should make sure they have it here in the United States. Um, so thank you for being here. Uh, you alluded before to the fact that American Jews are overwhelmingly progressive-minded, left-leaning individuals, really mainly with the exception of their attitudes toward Israel. And I think that there's the, the main problem with convincing not just the uh, parts of the American Jewish community, but also the non-Jewish American community, which is vastly larger than the American Jewish community, um, who, uh, many of whom um, uh, believe in very strongly pro-Israel sentiments. And 
I guess the issue that I have um, with, with trying to grapple with how to bring about change, changing people's attitudes in the American Jewish community and the non-Jewish community, is how do you overcome organizations like APAC, who are so powerful. I mean, they're, they're really in this political age where you have Democrats and Republicans losing the left and right so divided on everything. The one unifier, it seems to me, in American politics is Israel. And it's really amazing how powerful you know, something like APAC is. So how do you overcome that political force in America today to change the conversation, the one that you're having today, which I think a lot of American Jews uh, support you, but I think that that is being dominated by other forces like APAC. Um, American Jews, I think by and large, are not left-wing in their views about Israel. They do tend to distrust the Palestinians, uh, and, uh, or at least Palestinian leaders. Maybe not all Palestinians, but they tend to distrust Palestinian leaders. Um, and they tend to want to rally around Israel, especially during the wartime. But, um, I think American Jews, in the poll suggests this, are actually still do, uh, in significant numbers, support a Palestinian state. Um, uh, and um, and uh, believe that that's the ultimate path to peace. Um, the, the problem is um, that most American Jews are, have no relationship whatsoever to Jewish organizations. American Jewish organizations are not democratically elected. They're simply composed of the, pe of the small fraction of American Jews who want to be involved in them, and especially that even smaller fraction that has enough money to fund them. Um, uh, and in fact, if you look at the structure of American Jewish organizational life, they've actually, American Jewish organizations have actually become less broadly based since the 1970s, because what's happened is that as American Jews really started to assimilate into America, especially in the 60s and 70s, American Jews started leaving Jewish organizations. Why don't we need to be involved in Jewish organizations? That's small potatoes. We can be involved in any organization now. And so the organizations that people left tended to be less representative of where American Jews really are, more, more tribal, um, more suspicious of the outside world, um, and more single issue in their focus. I mean, if you look at American Jewish organizational life, up until the 1970s, I mean, the amazing thing about American Jewish organizations in the 1950s and 60s is the single biggest issue they were concerned with was civil rights. I mean, the American Jewish organizations were astonishingly involved. American Jewish organizations helped to fund the research um, uh, uh, that, that went into to showing the impact of segregation on African American children that helped to inform the Brown v. Board decision. In the 1950s, there were more lawyers working on civil rights at the American Jewish Congress than there were at the NAACP. Um, uh, it was common practice uh, as early as the 1920s for the heads of the American Jewish Committee and Jewish Congress to sit on the board of the NAACP. Um, so uh, um, the part of the problem was that as civil rights, once civil rights had been accomplished, and once American Jews started assimilating, the, these organizations reinvented themselves. APAC was a very marginal organization as late as the 1970s. They reorganized themselves as organizations devoted to defending the Israeli government against criticism. That's partly because there was a turn against Israel on the left in the 1970s, you know, culminating in the, the infamous 1975 Zionism equals racism resolution at the UN, which so profoundly alienated uh, American Jews. Today, I think, this is the fundamental problem. It's not that, that mo the, the Jews who are involved in Jewish organizations are to the right of the larger American Jewish population, but they're the ones who care most. It's not unique to Jews. I think if you look at Cubans, you'd find the same way. You'd find that lots and lots of American Cubans would be quite happy to change American policy vis-a-vis -vis Cuba, but they're not the ones who really get involved in Cuban, in Cuban organizations. So I think, um, and I should say about APAC, um, an organization actually that I have many friends who are involved in and work for, who are good-hearted people. Um, I think the, the fundamental problem with the way APAC defines itself is that, although it says, it may say it's in support of the two-state solution, since its basic orientation is to defend the policy of the Israeli government, whatever it does, it can't really even publicly contemplate the idea that to truly support a two-state solution might put you in opposition to the policies of the Israeli government. At this most recent APAC conference, APAC voted down a resolution which would have, which would have simply asked Israel to remove the illegal outposts. These are not even normal settlements, but outposts that are illegal even under Israeli law, they voted it down. Um, so I think in some ways you have to turn the question back to liberal-minded American Jews, which is to say, 
Do you care enough to be involved in this struggle? Do you care enough to get involved in Jewish organizations and try to wage a struggle for the character of the state of Israel? Do you care enough, as those people who do, who are to your political right, who devote a lot of time and energy and money 